so I'm going, going to talk about uh, genetic algorithms. Um, about me, I, most, a lot of my time was spending on Tika, Poi, content extraction, and other stuff. I t spoke a little bit about that yesterday. If you do want to talk about any of that, do let me know. Um, if, I'm also a um, committer on uh, Lucene Solar, a member of the ESF, and I have a PhD in classical studies. I used to be a professor, so I'm, I'm now a retired uh, philologist, philologist emeritus. All right, first off, I want to start this with a hat tip to Simon Hughes. He's already been here before. He's already done this, and he's already done this at Lucene Revolution, right? So thank you for coming for nap time um, immediately after lunch. Uh, do check out his talk. It's fantastic. Uh, he, he integrated some uh, genetic algorithm libraries into his framework to hit solar and, and use those. I unfortunately reinvented the wheel. Uh, so that's what you will be hearing about in, in today's talk. Uh, yeah, so there are several open source uh, relevance tools that I'm aware of. Uh, one is Quirite, which I'll talk about today. Uh, there's also, of course, Cupid uh, from Open Source Connections and Rated, Rated Ranking Evaluator, RRE. Uh, all three of these have their own uh, use cases and their own specialties and their own areas of, of interest. If there are others that you would recommend that I include on this list, please do let me know uh, so that we can try to combine efforts or at least cautiously and carefully and, and thoughtfully and graciously steal from each other. I'm, I'm friends with, with, with both projects. We're all good. We're all good. It, this is alphabetical order. It's all alphabetical order. Quiratech comes before Cupid. Right? It's alphabetical, right? Um, Quirita, um, so uh, seek and ye shall find. Uh, Quirita is the Latin there, hence the PhD thing in classics. Um, so Quirita is the imperative for seek, go find, um, because what we're doing, what I'll build up to is finding those uh, hyperparameters uh, to help you find stuff uh, in uh, solar or the other thing. All right, so I'll talk about uh, motivation. Uh, I'll talk about the evolution, as it were, of my methods uh, and how I came up with uh, how I got to uh, genetic algorithms. It's not that I came, came up with the notion that, let's see, we have neural nets. They're, they're making a big resurgence. What came after? Maybe, maybe evolutionary models. Maybe we could get those and we'll get the next big thing and I'll be ahead of it. It was nothing like that. This actually naturally evolved from the way I was working with data. Um, so it's, it's not like I picked a method and thought, oh, this will be cool and I'll use it. I just kind of fell into it. I'll talk about some really brief findings and then some next steps. So as we all know, search is easy. Yes. But of course it isn't. Um, there's a lot of complexity going on and we all know about all the different pieces here, and this is stolen entirely um, from Martin White, so thank you. Um, and there are all these different components that you need to twist, and there are knobs and all that other stuff. On the next slide, I have some of those knobs. There are uh, at least uh, 14 tokenizers, roughly 45 token filters, uh, and those are um, uh, single, uh, those aren't, don't even deal with the language um, specific uh, token filters. We have various query parsers you can use, you can boost on fields, queries, you can do phrasal boosting, you can do shingling, you can use different types of query operators, minimum should match, uh, must not. You can do token field-based scoring, oh, that's for the other tool, never mind. Um, synonym lists, taxonomies, uh, similarity scoring, different types of things on that. There was an awesome talk yesterday um, by the folks from Summitext on how you can uh, tune different uh, scoring parameters, and those, those, those techniques would actually fit in nicely with this framework where you can test out those various things. Um, elevate file external signal enrichment with NLP, re-ranking, and so on via uh, machine learning and learning to rank. And I'll talk a little bit about learning to rank uh, towards the end and how what I'm doing compares with that, or actually plays nicely with that. All right, so not only do you have all that, but some of the token filters themselves have 18 different things that you can twiddle with and, and play with, and you have all of these different things, and it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a blessing to have so many different ways that you can tune your system. It's a blessing to have this many different things you can do. What I often see is people just, you know, taking solar and running it, and they have, you know, the config file is the original config file with no changes to it. They just run it. <laughs> it's just not going to work that well, but they do it, as you all know. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, anyway, so there's a lot of stuff to do. So with all of those bells, whistles, knobs, and whatnot, one asks, well, how can I do a better job? How do I know I'm doing a good job, and can I do a better job? Well, one of those things you can do is go out and buy this book if you haven't already, um, Relevant Search, which is fantastic, um, by Doug Turnbull and John Berryman. Um, and then once you finish that book and understand some of the, um, some of the stuff behind uh, tuning, um, I also would like to thank Doug and John for giving me permission to use their search engineer logo in, in this, uh, or image in, in, this, in this slide deck. The basic notion, that, anyways, after you read that book, there comes a point where at least I started twiddling with stuff and playing with stuff and getting a little better here and a little better there. And I realized that 
as all as many programmers are, I'm extraordinarily lazy, and I may as well just you know turn things into in the in the processes and build up extra code around what I'm doing instead of rather just just doing this one-off task. So what I'll be talking about is ground truth based relevance testing. That requires ground truth. That requires that you have good ground truth, and that also requires that you avoid overfitting. Now, for good ground truth, I think there have been a fair amount of talks um, between here uh, and Berlin buzzwords about you know, the, the importance of getting good ground truth. You can do that in a couple of ways. One is um, by doing some uh, looking at user behavior and clicks and uh, purchases and all that stuff. I don't come from the e-commerce thing, so it's not, it's not, it's not purchases, it's conversions, right? Um, so please forgive me. Uh, yeah, classics, remember. Um, anyway, so. You have to have good ground truth, or you can hire a bunch of interns to sit down and, and, and try to tag stuff saying, if somebody's searching for this, they probably want that, and, and that kind of thing. So there are various ways of getting to that good ground truth. But for what I'll be talking about today, you need to have it, and it needs to be good. The other thing that can be very easy to do is fall into overfitting. And <laughs> if you do find yourself nodding off because it is after lunch, just go to this website, because it is hilarious with some urban legends, some actual true stories about how machine learning has gone wrong. And my favorite one is about the tanks. And this one may be urban legend, but the notion is that um, somebody wanted to create a, a, ta a, a classifier for whether a tank was in a, a camera image so that they could see if tanks were coming across the border. So they brought out the tank, and they had it in the, in the woods, in various places in the woods, and they took pictures of it, took pictures of it. And then they trained up a model for that versus no tank in the woods so that they could have this classifier. And it worked great. Build out this great model, worked great. And then in practice, they started getting all these false positives. And they realized that the machine learning algorithm, and this was neural nets, so 80s version of neural nets, it was targeting the sky, and it happened to be a cloudy day. So anytime it was a cloudy day, poof, it was a tank. <laughs> That's the problem with overfitting. Now, that story may be apocryphal. Go to this website. Seriously, just, just go now. It's awesome. Um, but they have a number of these things. And this does happen in real life. That particular story may be apocryphal, but there have been other things where um, uh, the, the medical imaging, um, the, the machine learning algorithm somehow queued off on which hospital it came from. So some hospitals had a much higher likelihood of some kind of uh, disease or something. So that's, that was it. So be careful with overfitting. All right. This is what uh, ground truth looks like. You have a relevance score. You have an ID for a document ID within your, um, within your index, and then what the query is. So you, you can have a human do this uh, or, or something, uh, but somehow you do have to have this ground truth. And again, thank you, uh, Doug Turnbull, John Berryman, and Open Source Connections for the inspiration for using this uh, test set in this uh, evaluation and also for generating and then sharing the ground truth. Uh, that's been awesome for me to work with, especially in demos. So speaking of genetic algorithms, I will start with generation zero. Run some experiments. At the, at the very least, I wanted to take some of the techniques that I had learned in, in this book and, and start using them. So I assumed that I had a static corpus, which is an assumption that not all of us can make, but at least some kind of offline, standalone test corpus that I could work with. And I wanted the results to be reproducible. I wanted to keep track of previous things I had experimented with. And I wanted a standard output and some flexibility on the scoring metrics. So what I did was come up with this thing where we have scorers and experiments. Pretty straightforward. For scorers, you can specify uh, normalized discounted cumulative gain, NDCG, or you know, any of the other fun uh, scoring mechanisms you have for this ground truth offline evaluation. And then you can specify experiments. So I want to have an experiment, uh, which I'll call title, where I am searching against a specific uh, solar URL, a specific collection. And I just want the query field that I'm searching on to be title. So it will take the ground truth queries and say Rambo and then QF title and send those off, okay? So you can add some more scores. One, one, one group I worked with really liked the notion of having at least one hit at. <laughs> it's like, all right, fine. I'm good with precision and recall NDC. Okay, you got it. So that's why we have that one. Um, and then we also have a total docs return. So you can see, you know, overall how many documents uh, would be returned if you use this algorithm and zero results, which a number of people do care about. If, if you're getting a bunch of zero results, that can be a problem. So you can add, you, you can specify a bunch of different scores. I've, I've, I have a number of available. We can always add more. And then experiments. And this is where, um, this is a fuller version of an experiment where you have uh, eDismax query parser. You have uh, query fields title boost to 10, cast boost 2. You have a tie of 0 0.8. Um, phrasal field 10, title 10, cast 2. And the query operator is a minim minimum should match of 2. So that's how I would specify that particular uh, experiment uh, as, I'm, as I'm running that against, the, um, against my, my corpus. And I have a name for it, title cast, PF tie 08 mm 2 Awesome, which for the record is better than when I was hacking these out in Notepad, saving it, running against Solar, see what I got. Yeah, don't do that. Um, this is much better. So the output after you run the experiments 
is there are three files that come out of this. And for anybody who was in my Tika talk uh, yesterday, my notion of user interface is Excel files, <laughs> sorry. Um, if anybody does want to help out, please do. Um, anyways, so one, one output is this table of, um, of the query, the experiment, uh, and then all of the scores for each individual query. So this is query name contact, the experiment is called text and, so that's using the and operator on the text field, um, at least one at uh, at N1, NDCG10, docs return, and so on. The other file that comes out is kind of the roll-ups of those. So for the experiment uh, that used, uh, that was named text MM2, so that's using the text field, using minimum should match of two. What was the number of documents that had at least one at M? Uh, what's the mean of the NDCG at 10, median, standard deviation, and sum of, of total docs return? So this gives you an overall sense of how well each experiment is doing across your query set. And this is sorted in uh, descending order by the target uh, metric of NDCG uh, at 10 and the mean of that. The third output it, it, it spits out is uh, p-value, pairwise p-value. So this will say, okay, so take this, yeah, how much really does it matter that 0.58 is bigger than 0.57? Yeah, it's bigger, does it really matter statistically? Yeah, now do we care about p-value anymore? According to the Twitter, we shouldn't, um, but I still, it's kind of an interesting thing, whether it's operationally observable or operationally useful, that's a different story, but it, we just throw something at it so that we get a general sense of, of, of what those variations are and whether one particular experiment was better than another particular experiment by whatever method you choose. Okay, so are we all good with, with generation zero? Specify, you, got, you have to have your ground truth, you specify your um, scoring algorithms, you specify your experiments, you run those, and then you can spit out, you, you get those three files. One is per query, one is the roll-up per experiment, and then the third one is the pairwise p-values between all of those experiments. So you can see that one is definitely better than another. Okay, everybody ready for generation one? Let us evolve. All right, so generation one takes this uh, search engineer and gives a little bit of coffee, right? So the, the search engineer says, if I know the parameters I want to experiment with, why, should, why do I have to specify all those combinations? Why do I have to manually fill out an, a JSON file with you know, 15 different experiments when there might be some way we could automate that? And not do the task we have to do today, but instead automate it and, and shave that yak and, 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 and all sorts of fun things. So, you know, so let's say I wanted to experiment with different analyzer chains. So instead of having different fields of you know, title or content or um, uh, producer, why don't we have for each field like, three different um, analyzer chains on it? So it would be title stemmed, title not stemmed, title light English stemmed. And in this uh, standalone uh, offline ex uh, experimental setup, it's okay to have that many fields for experimentation. Obviously in production, you don't want to have five copies of one. I'm sure somebody does. <laughs> anyways, in some, in, in some cases, you might not want to have that kind of thing. Um, anyway, so why don't we automatically generate the experiments? So we'll give this, this guy, if anybody gets the Moby Dick reference in Stubbs, uh, great. Um, I stole that from someone else, but look it up. Um, okay, now I want to experiment. I also want to generate all the permutations with field boosts and ranges. And then I also want to, to generate all the permutations with tie and PF and PF2 and BQ and boost and all these other things. Well, as you can see, as you go up, the risk of overfitting gets kind of big because, especially if you're just running on, on if you have not already pre-broken your uh, date, your, uh, your ground truth into training and test. So the risk of overfitting, if you're just doing a couple of things, might be kind of smallish. As you move up and start experimenting with more things, the risk of overfitting gets big. And by the time you start doing that, you are definitely in serious problem land. Again, if, unless you are unless outside of Quirita, you are already um, breaking your uh, ground truth into train and test, which I recommend doing no matter what. So generation 1A is automatically generate all experiments, just all of the combinations of all of those different things. So um, the way that you specify these, uh, these scores or these feature factories is you have the same score thing that you had for the experiments, but now instead of the edismax, you have feature factories which, explore, which, which define the feature space that you want to generate from, the ranges that you want to generate from. So at a high level, you just have scores and feature factories. So one of those, by the way, is the URLs. And the nice thing about the URL is that you can have, you can specify, um, obviously, different solar collections. So you can have slightly different under the hood um, uh, parameter differences between those. And that's, I've found that to be useful. All right, so this is what one of the uh, features looks like for the query. So it's an edismax uh, query. The fields are title, overview, and cast. I want to try it with default weights of 0, 2, and 10. Min set size 1 and 3, which means I can have, um, let's see, title, overview, cast, title, overview, title, cast. 
uh, overview cast and title overview cast. So those are the combinations, but then also with the different weights. Uh, so you can have, um, so you have all of these permutations. You have, di let's try out some different ties. So you generate some more permutations with all the different variations of ties and the variations of title overview and cast. And I want to experiment with or and a minimum should match one, minimum should match two, minimum should match three. When you build out all of these permutations, you now have 390 experiments to run. Solar's fast. This is multi-threaded. It's still going to take a long time. And this is just a, a, a small bit of what you could do when you're generating these things. Oh, the other fun thing, and this, gets, this starts getting really nerdy, but I know that I'm just trying to keep you awake after lunch. Um, this, I also had a parameterizable string. So if anybody's dealt with, um, with, date, with folding recency into relevance rankings, and you, have, you, know, you, you can, have, you can um, control the different slopes that you get based on uh, the two parameters that are in parens. What I did was I, I liked having uh, that one, two, and three kind of show up twice uh, or have the same number there. So you can parameterize the strings and say, I want to try this with one, I want to try this with two, and I want to try this with three. And the dollar sign one is just like an array x replace. So it will replace it with, with whatever you get in parameter one. Um, so this allows you to play pretty aggressively and pretty in, in, a, in a pretty powerful way uh, with boost queries or uh, BQ. All right. Now, of course, with this, you have permutation explosion. Uh, so beware. So this is, these are the number of experiments that you would generate uh, if you had no weights on a number of fields. So if you had title and content, you had two fields. Obviously, with no weights, you get three options and, and so on. If you have two weights, that gets bigger. Then when you start adding in the tie, the, op the uh, Boolean operator, the PF, the BQ and boost, things get huge rather quickly. So another option, the last, last option was generate all the permutations of the experiments I want, which gets big. Um, plan, and that's grid search. This is random search where you just randomly generate some experiments based on those parameters. So it's pretty much the same thing, except you don't generate all of them. You just generate some of them. And that's, that's an, an, another thing one could do. And you specify the number of, ex, of experiments you want to generate. Um, and you give it that uh, definition of what those ranges are that it should generate. Off you go, you have those number of experiments, you can run them. Still, depending on how many you're running, you could run the risk of overfitting, uh, and you could run into, obviously, local maxima are, are, are a problem. Random search, from what I can tell in what I've read of the literature for at least machine learning uh, uh, for hyperparameter tuning is actually pretty darn good. Um, not perfect. I, the Bayesians out there, I know you, you do better, but, but random search is math that I can handle. And um, it's, it's it, apparently to people who know what they're talking about, it's, it actually can be effective. All right, so that is generation 1A and 1B. 1A is you permute all of the variants of the experiments you want. 1B is you do random experiments from those permutations that you build. The output from generation 1 is still the same thing. You get those three files. You get, per, you get the query per experiment uh, file with all of the uh, output. You get the um, experiment roll-up file so you can see which experiment did best. And then you get that p-value um, pairwise uh, comparison between all of the experiments. So you can see if, if some are statistically uh, significantly higher than the others. All right, so that's generation 1. Let us now move into generation two. This is the actual, this is the gen genetic algorithm. Um, so with this, the notion is rather than just doing a random thing or rather than generating those random experiments, why don't we generate some random experiments? We'll call that generation zero. See which ones do best. And then we'll modify those, do some things to the top ones and start generation one. And then we'll run those and see which ones do best do some things to those and bring them down to generation two and rerun those. And at, at each generation, add some random experiments, completely random experiments. There's still the risk of overfitting, but that's okay. Let me talk now a little bit about uh, genetic, my understanding of genetic algorithms in a little bit, uh, just some terms to talk about, and then I'll show you how it actually works. Um, so you have the notion of a population. So at each uh, generation, you have how many experiments you, you're going to run. Uh, the generations, as I said, you start with one generation, then you pick some and do some stuff to them and start the second generation, run the evaluation against those, and run, run the next generation. Then the operations, and I'll, I'll show, I have this, <laughs> should, should, I have a build slide coming up to explain all of these. Random is just create a random experiment. Crossover is, is combine two experiments, combine the features of two experiments to create two new experiments. And then the third one is, is mutate. So you're taking an experiment and modifying something. So in solar terms, modifying something could be changing the weight on a field boost. Uh, it could be um, changing the, that Boolean operator from or to an and, or to a min should match two. Uh, it's e for each feature, there are some classes of them that, that I can subclass. But for, for each feature, there's a notion of at least random crossover and mutate. 
All right, so genetic algorithm basics, you start with generation zero. Uh, you have uh, five different experiments, so the population is five. Um, you run your, uh, you run your, your exper you run those experiments and you get NDCG s scores for those experiments. Um, then you, you do some stuff and you, you, you select which ones you want to move on to the next generation and what you want to do to them before they get to the next generation. So let's say we picked, um, again, it, somewhat at random, um, one and two, and we said, hey, let's do crossover on these two. So what you're doing is taking those features, so this one had title and uh, content, this one had producers and cast, you put those two together, and they'll have two children, some will have cast, some will have producers, some will have text, some will have content, some will have content, right? So it's just, it's randomly taking pieces of each and putting them into two different children. That's crossover. Now, I want, another operation is mutate. So I'll take um, the middle one and I'll just say mutate. So take it and just change some stuff uh, to it. So it might be drop a field, it might be change that weight, and so on. Four, and I'm just gonna move that forward, why not? I won't make mutate it. And then I won't move the bottom one forward, but I'll, create, I'll generate a new random experiment for uh, generation one. Then I run that against uh, against the, the ground truth set, and I get new scores. And then I continue this going on until um, either there, there's not much variation uh, until I reach that, that breaking point or that, um, that threshold of change, uh, or until, I, until the computer dies. Um, but anyways, you, you just keep repeating this and, 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 and watching as, as, as things change, and hopefully things will keep getting better. So that's the basics of genetic algorithms my understanding of the basics of genetic algorithms. There are people in this room who actually know a lot more about these and have written PhDs with them. Um, so I encourage you to speak with them about them. Um, anyways, so in interlude, how does this differ from learning to rank? From my understanding of learning to rank is that, oh, well, let me start. You still need all the sound engineering decisions. You have to have the same analysis chain. You have to have quality data. You have to do all of that stuff to get the basics of search in place before you even want to do this. And you also still have to have ground truth or some, you have to have some way of letting the machine figure out whether it's doing a better job or a worse job. The big difference from my perspective is that this learns the settings over the initial, the kind of the overall search across, across your index. Um, and it's not used as a re-ranking fun function, which LTR typically is on a, on a smaller subset at search time. So this is typically run, when I've been running it, it's been on a standalone uh, index. Uh, that I can play with, develop the numbers, and then ship those off uh, to um, production. <laughs> Sometimes by accident. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anyways, so the, the problem still with, with that is that you still have that little nuclear cloud over um, overfitting. So when I implemented the genetic algorithm, I very quickly baked in crossfold validation, and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, like in the next slide, for example. So I'm sure most people in the room know about n-fold cross-validation. This is an example of what happens with uh, four-fold cross-validation, where you um, these are you, you break your data into four chunks. In the first uh, in the first run, you treat the yeah yeah I know we're not backed up. I'm not even connected to the network. Um, anyways, you treat the first three as training, and then you test on on the fourth. In the second iteration, you treat the first two as train the first two and the last one as training, and so on. And, and you iterate through your corpus, or you iterate through your ground truth, uh, so that you're training on one chunk, testing on the other chunk. Four full cross validation is pretty small. Typically, you'd want to do more than that. Of course, there's leave one out. There are other ways of doing this kind of thing. But if you are not doing a train test split somehow, think of that nuclear cloud. Bad things can happen. You can have all sorts of false positives just when it's a cloudy sky. So be careful, please. All right, so this is, it, this is what happens with fold zero, fold one, fold two, fold three. And notice that these scores are based on, they're based on the testing uh, fold only. So this, this score we have for testing is you know, 0.45 for fold zero, 0.5 uh, for fold one, and so on. And then I average those across the folds to get what, the, what I would expect the overall performance to be on an unseen set that's roughly similar. Right, I mean, if you're processing news documents one day and then all of a sudden you're processing uh, Twitter, yeah, things are really gonna happen. Shift happens, I know, but not that dramatically. So this assumes that overall your data is, is roughly the same. So that's what n-fold cross-validation looks like. I think, I don't think you can defeat it in the genetic algorithm. I think it's, beat, it's built in. I think you might be able to do um, maybe one-fold or zero-fold and you might get around it. But please, use some sort of, uh, 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 cross-validation, or at least keep your testing separate from your training. 
So this is kind of what the output looks like as it's chugging along. Um, so for fold zero, the training, it runs, it, remember it randomly generates those experiments, it runs them, and then it will tell you which experiments uh, got what score after each generation. So it goes across all of the generations and it said that the best uh, experiment and the training was um, fold zero generation four experiment number two, and that had an MDCG 10 of 6.78 and so on. And it sorts them by descending order, shows you the top 10. It then picks, and this is where I could use some help from people who actually know about genetic algorithms. It just happens to pick the best one in training and runs that one experiment against the testing thing to get a score. Good. So here it did, it did great on training, but it didn't do so well on testing. That's not, this is a small corpus, um, but it, 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 it happens. Then after it runs those on all of the folds, it says that for, um, there were, and th this was uh, threefold cross-validation just for the purpose of demo. For, uh, for fold zero, remember the top score on testing was 0.55. The top score for, um, uh, for, for fold two was 0.79. The top score for fold one was 0.54. Just to make sure you're staying awake, I once had an unnamed colleague who did cross-fold validation and then reported the best one. <laughs> Don't ever do that, ever. <laughs> Average them, please. <clears throat> I won't say even at which employer that happened at. It may have been somewhere. Don't let that happen. Friends, don't let friends do something like that. All right, so that's, that's kind of the output of the cross-fold validation um, of, the, of the genetic algorithm. The other thing it outputs is a whole bunch of experiments. So for each generation, it will spit out those experiments. So then you can take those JSON files or components of those JSON files and run those individual experiments or modify them as you see fit. All right, so my initial kind of experience with this code is that it can be pretty neat. So with one uh, group I was working with, I was able to boost the NDCG from, um, from 0 0.25 to 0 0.3, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, I have a slide coming up on what that means. Um, the bad, uh, it turns out that if you don't run it long enough and you throw in all those parameters, including PS2, 3, 4, and PS5, I know you do, that doesn't exist for you, but it might on some, some versions of solar, joking. Uh, has anybody implemented PS5, PF5? <laughs> Good. Um, anyways, but seriously, when, when I did open up the parameter space to all of those different things, um, it, it chugged along and couldn't find anything that was better than the, um, than, the, than the baseline. The great, the awesome thing is, if I, start, if I go into a, a, a client space, I know what they're starting with. I use that as the starting seed for the genetic algorithm and then just let it run. If it does a better job, great, I won. If it doesn't do a better job and I let it run long enough, it probably means that's what they're gonna get with those features. And it's now time to do some feature engineering um, to, to help improve those features. Uh, or perhaps think about, yeah, so that feature engineering could be you know, natural language processing, uh, classification, query intent kinds of stuff. But the good thing is, I can just let that machine run. I don't have to say, oh, I wonder if I boost title to 12, or what if I do it to 11? I can stop all of that. I can just run all of these experiments and let, let, let the process figure out how well I can do on the current data that I have with the parameter sets, parameter ranges that I'm giving to it. So let's get back to that uh, NDCG of 0.25 to 0.3. I got permission from Jimmy Lin to say that this meets the L value which is different from the statistically significant p-value, the L-value is the amount of difference that it requires for Jimmy Lin to tweet about it. So Jimmy Lin tweeted that he saw a bump from 0.22 to 0.78, 0.5, give or take, I mean 0 0.05, give or take. So this means that I hit the L-value. Yes. All right, so the next steps, um, there are a couple that I have in mind. Um, that I really need to work on uh, rather dramatically. I do have a nice readme, I do have some examples, but still there, there are some areas where I might consider future work. But seriously, um, I do wanna, I have a beta release of the um, of 1.00, or it's actually an alpha, um, and I'm hoping to get out, I'm hoping to finalize-ish the API um, fairly soon and get that out. I want to try to add some ground truth free measures so you can just look at if we make these changes, how significantly different will our results be? Whether or not I have the effort or have the uh, resources to put together ground truth. You still want to know if I twiddle this, how, how profoundly different will things be for, for users? Um, I also want to add descriptors uh, for features so that we can say, oh, it turns out that uh, if we add a boost because this field has this value, I want, it, I want the genetic algorithm to tell us that that's what it, what it chose to do um, so that we can try to make sense of them. 
sometimes what I've seen is that once you break your query set into different classes of queries, so navigational queries versus information seeking queries or more targeted things, that you're going to get different settings. And that's where having that pre, um, excuse me, that, that, that pre-process of doing query intent classifier and then, and then specifying what query you want to do could make sense. Um, also, of course, Bayesian optimization, which is way beyond me, but there are libraries that can do it for me. Um, so potentially uh, trying to link those things in uh, to, to this overall framework. So I have now come to an end a little bit early, but we do have uh, time for questions. I believe, yeah, nine minutes, so I actually nailed it. Um, that's, the, um, that's the link. Uh, that's my contact information. So, questions? Yes? First of all, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I would like to see Bayesian optimization. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So, to, to, to my mind, um, it is that you, you, you fit, it's the other method of, of doing hyperparameter selection, and it takes into account what you already know about the distribution of your data. Uh, in, in proposing where you want to go with it. That's my level of knowledge about it. <coughs> so rather than doing that random stuff, it, it, it understands the distribution of your data and what things might help to start with and uses that when it starts, when it recommends uh, the next step. So it should be more efficient. I hear rumor that it can't, you can run into local maxima issues uh, if you don't twiddle it enough. Local maxima? Sure, so, sure. so local maxima means that um, if you're doing, let, let's say, okay, Let's, let's, let's say we are increasing the title weight by a little bit, and we start seeing performance going like this, and then we see it going down, and then we see it going up, 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 up. Local maximum is this little hill here, which means that I've done hill climbing, I'm good enough here, and if you, the, you can fall victim to local maxima, which means that you stop here and say, that's good, it's the local maxima, right? Versus the overall maxima. If you had done some a little bit more exploration across that parameter space, you would have found an actual maximum. That I can actually answer meaningfully. Yeah. Cool. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> please, please. The, the, yes. And this is yes. Yes. And that and that's the Bayesian optimization. And I've given you my sum total of knowledge about that. <laughs> so, so. At least I have a lead. Yes, you have a lead. I will give you a lead. Remember, better than nothing. <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How many queries and results do you have in your uh, draft tool? What do you think is the minimum number of queries? Yes, well, of course it depends. Um, but seriously, so in, in my little toy thing, I have whatever open source connections granted us. It, with, with actual clients, I've had between is it like 600 to 1,000 um, different queries? Um, I, it, I think a lot of the, the, talk to a statistician, which I'm not, um, but my general sense is that you need to have enough coverage of the various types of queries you have. And I, I've typically picked you know, the, the head queries, the ones that show up the most often, and then I've done some random sampling further down the tail. And I treat those as two different classes to see if they behave differently. That's what I've done, but. Oh yeah, so NDCG at, could be anything, or, or recall at, or precision at, you can pick what, 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 what you want to do in which, uh, which metric you want to use to optimize. Yes? So this uh, sort of optimization of all of the parameters, is it that big that we really want to just uh, sort of sacrifice uh, the possibility of finding the global maximum over getting trapped in the local maxima? Mm -hmm. But just using the genetic algorithm because there is a chance there, right? Yes. You're using the genetic algorithm, and uh, so there is a possibility that we don't find that best yep. set of combination of the parameter. Yes. So I'm trying to understand. So if we are working on a relevancy, right? Yep. And we want to just find the best because this is going to be set of parameters that you're using forever. Yep. So, oh, no, no, you got to retune, right? right. Da yeah. Shift happens. We have to change. That right. Okay. So, Sorry. Yeah. But uh, what I'm trying to understand is what we are sort of sacrificing here and what we are getting in return. Are we just sort of trying to save some processing time to just run less tests? Does yep. that make sense? Yeah. Why not running our test like for two weeks, three weeks, one month? 
and find the best combination rather than just using a randomized, sort of randomized yes. yeah, yeah. method to just uh, give us a good enough solution because genetic algorithm is just for good enough, it's not for the best. Yeah, and for that I point you to, <laughs> do you have an answer for this one? <laughs> yeah. Not to put you on the spot. But I'm talking about this scenario that is not, I mean, uh, really unlimited space. Yeah, it, this space yeah is it, it, if it's not unlimited, I would say do brute force, but carefully keep your training separate from your testing. So brute force is okay, but keep your training separate from your testing. And don't let them sneak in. There are very subtle ways that, that you can get slippage into, into that. You know what? You don't need the training and the ENFOL validation if you don't use the, the genetic algorithm or don't use learning, you know? What I'm trying to say is that you're gonna try all the combinations. Uh, no, no, I disagree with that. If, if, you, if, you run all of the, if you run all of the permutations on your, ground, on your ground truths, on your full ground truth set, you, you don't know, and if you don't take into account the, the variability within that and how it's working throughout that, you don't know what the, what the, what the very, break it, break it up, please. Just do it because you, 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 can, you, can, you can definitely fall into problems where you're, you're overfitting for that data set. And, that's, and when, when I say running all of it, I, I need to think about this more, but it but worries me. You have training and testing that you want to break it down. Whenever you are using genetic algorithm, it makes sense yeah. to just break it down because you have training and testing and cross validation is the solution. Yeah. But here you, don't, you just have testing, testing and testing. No, because you don't know all the possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Let, let's take that question offline. I don't agree with you, but I need to think about it. Not in front of this many people. Yes. Did I mention the classics background in the back, please? Because you defended me? No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Right, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. It's, a, it's a growing thing. Um, I, there, there's no, I, I would not have a reason to, 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 to say one is better than the other, and that would be far. I, I think that that would probably be a lot faster. <laughs> so many good, yes. Yep. It, it all depends. It depends on, on the variability within your, within your uh, test set. You, you want to make sure that it's representative somehow. Sometimes that requires uh, stratified sampling to make sure that if you have rare cases, that you want to make sure that that's in the testing, um, that it's there. Uh, I typically, even in this kind of thing, I want to leave one set out just to see what happens. And then after I do that, run it. Because I, it, it was drilled into me in grad school to keep those things separate. Not classics grad school, other grad school. Um, I, I took some machine learning classes while I was a classicist. Don't ask. Um, anyway, so, so yeah, it's been. I, I would recommend doing that. Yeah, so even if I run this once, I want to, because you could get, you could get caught on a local maximum, I would I run this algorithm a couple of times to see how, how it's doing and what your variance is. Um, because if the variance is huge, then that's kind of indicative that, you're not, that you have a, a non-robust system and that you could be surprised by what you find in, in practice. Okay, yep, sorry. Yeah, and that gets back to the question at the back. Why don't you just run? Why don't you just do learning to rank? And the answer is, please do. <laughs> I'm sorry. If, yep. Oh, um, so are the mutations totally random, or is there any history of kind of what you do? There is no history. They're, they're, they are random. Yes. In my in my instantiation, it could be wrong. I don't know. Do you think that that would help? 
don't know. And I think that might be getting, getting into the, the Bayesian optimization and keeping track of what you learned about those modifications before. Yeah. But yes, probably. Yes. Yeah, like parts on your final results slide where you're showing median and standard deviation. Yeah. But you looked into, yeah, you're showing pretty significant standard deviation yeah. for the size of the result. And yep. You looked into whether that changes significantly if you change the parameters of the yes. Yeah. Yes, a absolutely. And, and the reason that I report those is because those things are important. You cannot just report the mean. You have to get the other dis di distributions. So this is a, a toy set. Um, no, no offense, open source connections, but it, it's a toy set that I just used for the demo. Um, in practice, I'm seeing a little bit, the, 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 the bounds are smaller. The, the, no, but I should. 